Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so it's um, already four. Uh, let me uh, just get started. I'm, I'm sure more people will be showing up. Um, so today, uh, so I would like to introduce our speaker, Professor Satoshi. Yeah, Professor Satoshi Mitarai, and to celebrate uh, uh, his uh, recent promotion to tenure full professor. And uh, um, so just a little background of um, the Provost Lecture Series. Uh, so we started this Provost Lecture Series in October 2022, and it has been almost one and a half years. Um, so we, uh, so throughout, um, the past 18 months, as you can see. So we, we cover many of our uh, faculty members. Either they, they got, uh, we celebrated their retirement or promotion to associate or full professors. We also um, invited faculty members who received um, important awards to celebrate their accomplishment. And so in uh, 2024, um, so we um, so started this this year. Professor Takahashi recently retired, and Professor Yasha Neiman was promoted to associate professor. And unfortunately, everyone is busy, so we're able to cram uh, into two lectures today and also next Monday. And uh, so we apologize for this back-to-back -back, um, arrangement. And uh, um, so again, as usual, I would like to uh, thank many people uh, who have been very supportive of the Provost Lecture Series, people from the Office of the Provost and uh, CPR members, and also the core facility, um, especially engineering section, Patrick and also Chad, for helping to make the gifts. And so today I was, um, I was tasked, I was asked by Satoshi to introduce him. So I will be very brief. And I would like to thank uh, Yumiko, so uh, Satoshi's wife. Many of you probably know her. Probably some, uh, some of you, your kids, um, uh, learn piano lessons from Satoshi's wife, Yumiko-san. Um, so um, thanks to her, she sent me some important pictures uh, um, so, so that I'm, I'm able to introduce Satoshi to, to illustrate Satoshi's journey um, after he graduated, uh, uh, after you got your bachelor's degree from uh, Japan. So I will start from Seattle. And uh, so the, the first photo, that's University of Washington, so we actually have some connection. I realized, so I arrived uh, University of Washington in 2008. I think that's when you, uh, the, yeah, after, yeah. yeah, after, but Satoshi already left. So we were actually in the same department, mechanical engineering department. And, and so this is our kind of, uh, the, the nice, uh, the center court area of University of Washington. As you can see, Satoshi is uh, um, full of, I guess, hope. And, uh, <laughs> and also, apparently, he's a, a very serious baseball fan. So I got several photos, but I'm just highlighting two. I think you are very engaged. I assume you are also a very good ba baseball player. No, not really. No? OK. But yeah, but in Seattle, so, so we, we have the celebrity, uh, the baseball player from Japan. And uh, so this is a picture of Satoshi here with his PhD advisor, Professor James Riley, uh, who is also a very good colleague of mine. So, we're, so when I was a professor at, at UW, we're in the same building on the third floor of the mechanical engineering building. And it's very old school. There's only one bathroom. And, and uh, only until, I think, 1990s, before it was only for male uh, professors. And, uh, but two years before I joined the department, they converted that to kind of uh, uh, only open to 
professors on the third floor, but we all have a secret key we can use. <laughs> Um, so that's the first day when I arrived uh, UW. That's uh, you know Jim Riley told me, oh, yeah, yeah. yes, how I can gain access to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is a nice picture to celebrate. I think Satoshi received his uh, PhD, and uh, and he studied uh, the chemical reaction in isotropic turbulence. So that's his uh, thesis topic. And uh, Satoshi even bought this uh, graduate, the, the, the UW gum, so you have been using it. Recently, yeah. Yes. I got to my tent. Okay. And I know it's very expensive. It's like made of velvet. So, so Satoshi has taste. And after Seattle, uh, Satoshi moved to Santa Barbara. And so that uh, started his journey as a, a, a postdoc. And there he started working on ocean turbulence. And also around that period, uh, so both Emma and Lynn were born. And uh, so you can see some photos. The left one, thanks again to, to Yumiko, share these uh, nice photos. And uh, in between, Satoshi was also trying to write papers and working on his laptop. <laughs> Yes, yeah, you still have um, like a uh, baby face, right? <laughs> oh, so hold on. And after UC Santa Barbara, so Satoshi uh, moved to OIST, uh, which started in 2009. And uh, Satoshi, so based on my knowledge as a neighbor, Satoshi is a very neat person. He's always washing his cars. <laughs> Uh, every other day. So I always tell Elliot, I said, look, Satoshi's washing his cars again. And our cars, uh, nobody washes it. <laughs> and also I learned from Satoshi where to get the um, triple king size futon cover. And uh, it's really hard to find. I asked the resource center, I asked my RUAs, nobody had the answer until one day I was talking to Satoshi. He told me where to order. Uh, these very specialized uh, sheets. And uh, so you can see Satoshi was getting ready maybe to take uh, Lin and uh, Emma to school with a nice uh, school outfit. So that's 2011. And uh, as you can see, there's uh, some crossover. Uh, Satoshi's unit is very popular. It's called marine biophysics unit. And sometimes students got confused, you know, the first year rotation students, they approached me before they arrived. They were like, can we do a rotation in your unit? So I said, yes. And then after a few months, they told me like, oh, please don't be angry. We, we were actually interested in NBU. See, my unit, the abbreviation is NBNU. <laughs> And over time, I also understand why, because Satoshi is a great mentor and a colleague. See, look at all the great parties he has thrown, you know, celebrating with food and also with music, I heard. It's always uh, very lively. And last year, Satoshi was promoted uh, to full professor, and so that's a big accom accomplishment. And as you can see right after, so, so Satoshi um, or his daughters convinced Satoshi to get a very special puppy from Raikon, the mall on, 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 on the first floor. And so this is a designer dog. Uh, and the name is Mocha. So I know Satoshi, I see now you have been walking Mocha uh, with Emma and your kids all the time. So. So I say Mocha is a partner for exploring the land after you master the sea. So in addition, I want to show this really funny photo. So last year, probably everybody remembers, uh, so we, we had this really bad typhoon incident. And so yeah, so a lot of damage because our, so we're neighbors uh, uh, living in the seaside, uh, uh, faculty seaside house compound. And, but Satoshi's house got the most damage. 
as you can see, during the middle of the night, the door was uh, blown open. And we heard you and Yumiko had to hold the door <laughs> um, until the help arrived. Uh, and so, so, so I say, why did the oceanographer's door got blown off during the typhoon? Because even the sea wanted to learn from the best. <laughs> so without further ado, Satoshi, we look, congratulations, and we look forward to learning more about your journey. <clears throat> All right. Thank you for the nice introduction, Amy, and uh, those are kind of uh, unexpected. And uh, you said you are not going to embarrass me, but uh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so those are really nice, uh, you know, refreshing. I, I refresh my memory, and yes, those are the journeys I have been through. And, uh, you know, today I want to, I, this is not going to be a really scientific presentation. So I want to share with you a history or evolution of my research unit, the Marine Biophysics Unit. So I thought that this is going to be a more useful and also enjoyable for most of you. So as Amy explained, I joined OIST in September 2009, long time ago. As an independent new investigator, I don't know how many of you actually know that. Shimanuki-san, you remember that. So it is called INIs. So remember that OIST was not a graduate university yet. So INIs were converted to a tenure track assistant professor after OIST became a graduate university. And as Amy explained, I did my PhD at the UW. I studied uh, fluid mechanics, uh, chemically reacting turbulent flows. Then I did my postdoc at the UC Santa Barbara, so I switched my field from fluid mechanics to uh, marine science or marine ecology. And I did this uh, change, actually, um, I made this change before I actually applied for a PhD program based upon the suggestions from my friend in Tokyo. So the uh, idea was to have a concrete background in one discipline before jumping on to interdisciplinary science. I am interested in the role of ocean turbulence in regulating biological processes at the different scales from like centimeters to hundreds of kilometers. I want to understand the coupling of biological processes and the physical processes in the oceans. So my uh, postdoc supervisor, Dave Siegel, actually suggested that my research unit name, the Marine Biophysics Unit, based upon my research interest. And uh, I accepted that without understanding what it really means. <laughs> okay, so this nice picture shows the Oyster Campus in 2018, but none of these existed when I arrived at Oyster. So where was the marine biophysics unit in 2009? Do you remember Shimanuki-san? <laughs> we are here at the OIS Seed Seaside House. We actually use one of the guest rooms as our office space. <laughs> but you know, I and I, independent new investigators, are allowed to have only two staff members. So this was actually uh, large enough. So I recruited uh, one technician and one postdoc and uh, one internship student from France. So this was a marine biophysics unit in 2009. Ulf Skogland actually moved in, arrived at the OISA pretty much at the same time. So he was actually using a room right next to me. So for those who know Ulf, Ulf well, it, you probably can imagine how much time he spent in my office every day. <laughs> <laughs> so he became a really good friend and we moved to Lab One in 2010 and shared a space there. And uh, in 2012, uh, actually, my research unit moved to Lab 2. So this brochure shows a list of PIs when or soon after I joined OIST. So there are only 27 PIs back then. Harry, probably you remember this state, yeah. So there were three INIs. Holga Yenke Kodama arrived first, then I arrived, and soon after that, Sasha Mikheva arrived. And uh, 
Um, unfortunately, I'm the only one who is still remaining at the OIST. I guess they have a better life. Um, but anyway, um, so the number of the PIs actually increased to 35 by uh, November 2011. And uh, the brochure became two pages. Like this is page one. Who joined? I guess uh, Evan joined. Dennis. Oh, Nick is there too. <laughs> and page two. So you see um, Fujie joined at this time, and uh, Tadashi joined, and uh, Matthias too. So this is a list of the PIs uh, in 2011, and uh, this was the time OIS was growing really rapidly. And I know that I uh, got um, lots of gray hairs compared to the picture here. But uh, you know, looking at uh, this brochure, maybe I'm not the only one. So. <laughs> Okay, so I proposed a small project in the marine ecology. So central problem in the marine ecology is to describe marine population dynamics at the beautiful marine habitats such as coral reefs and also kelp forests in the constantly changing physical oceanographic environment. So many marine species have a planktonic larval life stage during which Larvae can be transported over hundreds of kilometers um, over months. So larvae are transported by ocean circulations during which they actually develop their competency for the next life stage. The only lucky larvae that are transported to a suitable habitat during their competency can settle there and recruit two adult populations. So this lava dispersal is a predominant means that connect distant habitats and drive marine population dynamics. Now this lava dispersal has been often modeled by uh, simple diffusion models in which larvae spread out nicely around their natal areas as if it were molecular diffusion process. But actually the marine life is embedded in a turbulent ocean. So this is a picture spiral eddy of the coast of Japan. You see a big eddy and the chlorophyll distributions in the South Atlantic. Again, you see lots of eddy motions. Eddies in the Black Sea and the chlorophyll distributions in the California current. You see that uh, coastal eddies are dominating. And there are some data link the larval dispersal and the oceanic eddies. So black vectors indicate uh, an eddy here and the red bars indicate uh, observed larval fish abundance. So the, the larval fish abundance peaked near the center of the eddy, meaning that the actually oceanic eddies transport larvae as a coherent packet. So my proposed research was to quantify dispersal processes around Okinawa and also describe the coral and their predators crown thorn starfish population dynamics. So for example, uh, this movie shows a 30 day trajectories of uh, uh, 282 ocean drifting buoys deployed from uh, Okinawan coral reefs. The blue lines indicate the 30 day trajectories and you can see that you know, some of these drifters actually entered the strong western boundary current, the Kuroshio current. You see a uh, like straight, straight like lines on the left hand side of the figure, that's a Kuroshio current. And some drifters actually went all the way to mainland Japan and approached the Tokyo area. But as you can see, actually not so many uh, drifting buoys entered the Kuroshio. The most of them are stayed around Okinawa, making a really complicated spaghetti-like patterns, which actually is reflecting the motion of oceanic eddies. But to really understand the population dynamics of corals and the cots, I really needed somebody who understand the marine biology. So I collaborated with a, a marine biologist from the Sesoko Station of the University of the Ryukyu. Sesoko Station was established in 1971, and uh, many international and also domestic researchers, students visit there to conduct physiological studies of marine organisms. 
I mostly collaborated with their director back then, Professor Kazuhiko Sakai, and I recruited uh, one of his uh, former students, um, Masako Nakamura, as my first postdoc. And uh, Masako E is now um, tenure as associate professor at uh, Tokai University. So we monitored the coral and the chromosome starfish recruitment uh, numbers at the Kume Island and also the Kerama Islands and Okinawa Island, which I really enjoyed a lot. And later on, another postdoc joined, Yuichi Nakajima. He actually uh, added the population genetics to our project in collaboration with Nori Sato. So this is the plan, and we are happily working on that. You know, when I joined OIST, Sydney Brenner was the first president. And Sydney gave me a uh, lot of nice suggestions. And one of the things Sydney recommended was to have the, my first OIST workshop with his friends, informaticians from Edinburgh. So I followed his suggestions, and I organized a workshop in 2010. But actually, I had no idea what to do with informaticians. I had no contact with informaticians. So I asked Sydney, OK, Sydney, I'm going to do the workshop. But what is the scope of this workshop? His answer was, the scope of this workshop is to find it out. So uh, I was really confused. <laughs> but you know, like about 10 years later, you know, I started to understand what he meant by looking at the, like, you know, more and more applications of machine learning to the like, earth science, including marine science. Just like Gerald, you are doing here at the OIST, I finally understood when I spoke to you. So Sidney was talking about it at this time in 2010. And by the way, this is a famous marine biologist, Bob Werner. He's the one who convinced me to apply for OIST. So in 2011, I got involved in a so-called R&D cluster project funded by the cabinet office. So Nori Sato and several other PIs were also included in this R&D cluster project. So everyone had the different objectives. The, my part of this project was to assist the establishment of a marine science hub in Okinawa by taking advantage of natural resources of Okinawa, such as coral reefs, typhoons, and also hydrothermal vents. But before I talk uh, much about uh, this R&D cluster project, I want to clarify one thing. So, uh, you know, what the marine science is. The marine science is the, oh, I cannot read it, um, the scientific study of the oceans. It is an earth science which covers a wide range of topics, including ecosystem dynamics, ocean currents, waves, geophysical fluid dynamics, and etc, etc. So it covers a wide area. And it overlaps with marine biology and also ecology. Marine biology is a study of, a, of a what? <laughs> of the, of the, of the, I need a glass, oh no. <laughs> um, of the biology of marine life, organisms in the sea. So it focuses on the biology, not the ocean. And the ecology is the study of the relationship among living organisms, including, including humans and their physical environment. It's about marine organisms and the environment. They all, the, all these overlap, but marine science is not equal to marine biology or ecology. It's just a bit bigger than that. And also for your information, when the cabinet office mentions ocean, so this is what they have in their mind. So if you go to their web page, there is an explanation for the basic plan on the ocean policy. The unfortunately, most materials are provided only in Japanese, but there is an English material as well, just like this summary slide. So you can read through this later on, but uh, in short, they expect us, the scientists, to promote the R&D of marine science and technology and also maintain and strengthen ocean surveys, observations, monitoring. So having this in mind, how could we com 
contribute to the R&D cluster project to assist the establishment of a marine science hub by taking advantage of these natural resources. So Okinawa's beauty, beautiful coral reefs lie at the northern boundary of the Pacific Ocean. The column up here indicates the number of coral species. The center part, the triangle shape, is called the coral triangle. The Great Barrier Reef is a you know, big player in the study of marine ecology and marine biology in the coral reefs. And the Morea, a long-term ecological research site, has been established in 2004 by a U.S. National Science Foundation to understand coral reef ecosystems. The University of Hawaii operates the Pacific Island Ocean Observing System. And also, let's not forget about the University of Ryukyu. They have uh, more than 50 years of history for the study of coral reef biology and also ecology. Okinawa's coral reefs are also impacted by typhoons, tropical cyclones. So Okinawa is situated in a typhoon alley, the region with the most frequent and fully developed tropical cyclones on Earth. So this map shows tracks and the intensity of all tropical cyclones over 20 years, 1985 through 2005. Kara indicates the intensity. So red corresponds to category five hurricane. So tropical cyclones are most in intensified around Okinawa. And because of the global warming, the tropical cyclones will be even more intensified in the future. And Okinawa occasionally encounter this, the series of typhoons. I don't know if you are here in 2012, we had a five typhoons in August 2012, just in one month, every weekend. Do you remember that, Harry? Yeah, and uh, you know, the power outage lasted like four days. That was disaster. And uh, we occasionally have these things, you know, the left movie shows the first three typhoons, the right one shows the, the last two typhoons, all in one month. It was really every weekend. So Okinawa is also located close to these things, hydrothermal vent fields that support the ecosystems of um, uh, exotic species that do not depend on the photosynthesis. Okay. The around 400 degrees Celsius of water, hot water is coming out from the bottom of the ocean through these hydrothermal vents, including hydrogen sulfide and uh, also other minerals which eventually form rich deposits of gold, silver, copper, rare metal, and so on. And these hydrothermal vents are distributed like this. There are two tectonic types. The vent fields in the Western Pacific, no, Eastern Pacific, and also the mid in the Atlantic Ocean are distributed at the mid-ocean ridges, where the plates are being created and also moving apart. And those on the Western Pacific side actually are distributed along the sub subduction zone. So hydrothermal vents on the, this side was actually can be found on the arc and the back arc basins. Hydrothermal vent was first discovered at this point, East Pacific Light by the Utsuhol Oceanographic Institution in 1977 and JAMSTEC Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology, based at the Yokosuka, not too far away from Tokyo, has been investigating the northwest, northwest hydrothermal vent fields intensively. And the pilot test of mining and the pumping of hydrothermal deposit actually uh, took place in uh, Okinawa in 2017 for the first time in history. So to conduct any marine science um, research, we need to secure, uh, secure an access to the oceans. Not only the coastal ocean, but including the open ocean too. So we made a joint research agreement with JAMSTEC to secure access to hydrothermal vents in Okinawa. So in 2012, 
I actually designed my own research expeditions using Janssen research vessels to collect biological samples from hydrothermal vents and uh, to install a bunch of physical oceanographic instruments. And uh, you know, two researchers from uh, Goriani unit and Sato unit are also joined this research cruise. So this was really exciting that uh, all we did was actually staying in the bay in Amami Island, drinking, eating, talking <laughs> about the week. Guess why? You already saw it. There was a slow moving typhoon that stayed around Okinawa for about one week. So we couldn't do anything. But after that, in 2017, you know, three postdocs, two students, and myself joined three different research expeditions. And uh, you know, like research expeditions for my students and the postdocs were great. Guess what happened to the expedition I joined? We got the two typhoons. <laughs> <laughs> so the wave height was, can you believe that? Seven meters all night. So my Apple Watch gave me all sorts of compliments because it thought I was doing exercise all night. <laughs> But anyway, so this collaboration went well, and we also made a joint research agreement with the Okinawa Prefecture Government's uh, Fisheries Research Center. They have been investigating the Kuroshio current in the last 30 years or so. So we joined their Kuroshio, Kuroshio investigations, and we deployed some instruments from their research vessel too. And the former postdoc of mine, Daisuke Hasegawa, played a central role in this collaboration. And he is now a tenured researcher at, uh, at uh, National Research, no, National, National Fisheries Research Institute in Tohoku. And he is still investigating the Kuroshio current. And this center was kind enough to let Tsumoru Shintake to test out his uh, tidal power generation equipment. We also made a cooperative agreement with the Japan Coast Guard which enabled the more frequent ocean observations around Okinawa. So we made agreement with the 11th uh, Coast Guard head, Regional Coast Guard headquarters in 2012. And uh, you may remember this, but we made another agreement with the Naha Coast Guard office lately. So international collaborations actually are not, it's really a common thing in the marine science because the oceans are too big to be covered by one institute. So we uh, actually hosted the uh, OIST workshops three times in six years, 2012, 13, and 16, and two of them are actually co-funded by the US National Science Foundation. So two workshops are organized with the uh, Moria Long-Term Ecological Research Group, and also Professor Kazuko Sakai from the University of the Lucas. And the one workshop was organized with uh, Utsuhoro Oceanographic Institution and also JAMSTEC to study the hydrothermal vents on the Western Pacific Ocean. So these workshops and international collaboration led to two uh, synthetic papers. So here's one example. What we did here was we put all coral recruitment data together from many different regions, color-coded by, color-coded in this figure. And uh, we, we assessed how the coral reefs are changing in the world. And we use these settlement plates to count the number of coral, recruiting coral larvae. So what we found out was coral reefs are actually shifting away from the equator. Here is another example. We assess the connectivity of hydrothermal vent fields in the Western Pacific Ocean. Here's a white circles indicate 11 different geographically independent regions. And the color indicate the direction of a connectivity. Blue indicate the northward. Purple is also indicate the northward. And the green indicates the westward connections. So you can see that, that these regions are connected mostly in a unidirectional way and uh, according to our estimates, these connections happen very infrequently, once every 5,000 to 10,000 years. 
This is a close-up view of the connectivity within an Okinawa trough, Manus Basin, and the Lao Basin. The hydrothermal vents within these backup basins are well connected without any particular directionality. And there are gaps in the Southwest Pacific Ocean, but these gaps can be connected for species with longer than average plankton club durations. But these connections happen even more infre infrequently, like once every 100,000 years. So when we do the deep sea mining, we should have these things in mind. So we successfully um, secure the access to the oceans, and we developed uh, international collaboration, and we generated some synthetic studies on the coral reefs in the world, and also hydrothermal vent on the Western Pacific Ocean. But did we really respond to the goal of this RND cluster project? Maybe we made a network, but I'm not sure if this was going to lead to uh, the research hub. So we wondered if we can do anything by taking advantage of uh, most frequent and fully developed typhoons or tropical cyclones on Earth. The ocean responses to tropical cyclones actually remain a central problem in uh, marine science. Here yeah, I'm not talking about like typhoon predictions or weather forecast. I'm talking about the ocean responses to typhoons. Typhoons mix the upper ocean, as you probably well know. So it's been well known that uh, typhoons mix the upper ocean, creating or reducing the temperature of the sea surface drastically. So here is one of the first satellite derived infrared images of the sea surface. The color indicates the sea surface temperature, and the right panel shows the sea surface temperature after the passage of Typhoon Hurricane Gloria in 1985, almost 40 years ago. And the left panel shows the sea surface temperature before the hurricane passage. The middle one shows the temperature difference between left and right. So temperature actually dropped about one to five degrees Celsius during this passage of hurricane. Okay, so this shows a nice res oceanic response to typhoon winds, but the uh, question is why do we need to care this? You know, the sea surface temperature will go back to the normal condition in days or weeks. And that is actually true, but it may not be the case below the sea surface. You know, typhoons mix up ocean, homogenizing the temperature to certain depths, meaning it cools down the surface water but it warms up the deeper waters. And these warmed up, warmed up waters, as indicated in this schematic diagram, may actually remain beyond the winter, winter season and until the next typhoon season. So marine scientists actually do care these ocean heat content. So it really, typhoon really matters in that sense. Also, let me explain that the ocean responses to typhoon by using these ocean drifting buoys once again. The orange spheres correspond to the locations of the, these uh, ocean drifting buoys, and the blue lines indicate the seven-day trajectories. And you are going to see the yellow line shortly that indicates the track of Typhoon Jawad in 2012. 2012. So I guess this is one of those five typhoons in uh, August 2012. So that went actually right on the Okinawa Island. And this is how the, the ocean drifting buoys responded to typhoons. So what do you see here? So if you look at the ocean drifting buoys on the right hand side of the typhoon truck, it actually rotated clockwise like that. And the rotation period was about 25 hours. But if you look at the ocean drifting buoys on the left-hand side of the typhoon truck, they do not rotate. Why this is happening? So let me explain that. Um, why it is happening? Because Earth rotates. <laughs> that's, that's the answer, you know. So guy is going to throw a ball on the rotating round bottom pan and uh, you are going to look at how they look like 
from the cameras attached to this rotating fan. Um, so this is it, okay? Guy throwing a ball. If you look at the cameras that rotate with a round bottom pan, it looks like this. It shows the clockwise rotating or like, like circular motions. This is called inertial oscillation. The inertial oscillation is found in the oceans because Earth rotates similarly to this rotating fan. Okay, but why typhoon cause the inertial oscillation only on the right hand side of the typhoon track? Actually, typhoons cause the resonance of inertial oscillation. You know, to make a resonance, you have to apply forces to materials in the right direction at the right timings. On the right hand side of the typhoon track, typhoon winds actually tend to push balls or drifters or anything in the clockwise directions. On the left hand side, typhoons try to rotate the balls in the counterclockwise direction. And because of the direction of the Earth's rotations, inertial oscillation in the northern hemisphere is always clockwise. So this is why the resonance of inertial oscillation happens only on the right hand side of the typhoon track. So let me show you how common this uh, inertial oscillation is using the ocean circulation models responding to typhoon winds, uh, typhoon wind products provided by the Japan Meteorological Agency, JMA. Here the color indicates the sea surface temperature, and the grayish arrows indicate the first, o first surface ocean currents, faster than like 80 centimeters per second. And the black arrows indicate, represent the typhoon uh, Samba here in this case in 2012. So you can see that the surface water ocean rotated on the east side or on the right hand side of this uh, typhoon track. And this movie shows uh, the ocean responses to two more typhoons following the left movies actually. So left, left, left movies actually from September 14th through 25. The right one is right after that, September 27th through October 22nd. So uh, the surface ocean was rotating a lot, but not everywhere, but on the right hand side of the typhoon truck. And this means if the simulations are correct, the surface ocean in the east part of the Okinawa Island was rotating from September 14th through October 22nd over one month. So it's a common thing. So to really understand these oceanic responses to typhoons, energy transfer from typhoon winds to the upper ocean needs to be quantified accurately. For that, the simultaneous monitoring of the typhoon winds and also the upper ocean current is needed. And uh, you know, the big moored offshore platforms in those pictures can actually do that. And here is the observation. And you don't need to understand this, big, need this figure, but uh, if you look at the x-axis, x-axis indicates the wind speed. Wind speed actually do not, does not exceed 25 meters meter per second, corresponding to typhoon winds, meaning typhoons or tropical cyclones actually rarely hit these Moored, moored offshore platforms. So because we are in, uh, situated in a typhoon area, maybe we can extend this graph. So uh, we can try a simultaneous monitoring of wind and currents. And uh, we try that, but not using these moored offshore platforms. They're expensive. So we use a newer, more affordable, autonomous ocean observing platform, the wave glider. So the wave glider consists of two parts, surface float and the submerged wings. They are connected by the cable. Surface float is equipped with the solar panels here and the control box communication device. I don't remember what, what this was, and, and the weather station, and the acoustic Doppler current providers, okay? So wave gliders allows us, allows us to observe atmospheric and oceanographic uh, field under extremely dangerous conditions far from the shore. So we can control that remotely and also in real time. And it's not that expensive. 
submerged wings convert wave energy into thrust like in this movie. Okay, so the water speed is actually about uh, 50 centimeter per second. Now I want to show you our first and probably most successful typhoon observations. So we aim to enter the eye area of two typhoons in 2013. Typhoon Fito on your left and the Typhoon Danas on your right. And actually you can find Fito in the Danas movie. So that's, maybe you can see that once again. So this is Danas and you see Fito ahead of Danas. So they passed Okinawa Island only separated by a day. So we first directed our web glider to Fito. But the, when we learned that the Danas actually had turned into a tropical cyclone, web glider was here on October 5th. Uh, we uh, decided to you know, like give up a plan for Fito and directed web glider into Danas because Danas was much closer. So in two days, the wave glider was here on October 7th, made the closest encounter with Typhoon Danas when the Typhoon Center was at this point. And in these two days, wave glider actually shifted over 100 kilometers. And after this close encounter, actually we, uh, we uh, couldn't control the wave glider. It started to drift showing a nice inertia oscillation, becoming a really expensive drifting buoy. And five days later, our friends, the Japan Coast Guard actually retrieved the wave glider for us for free. We didn't need to pay that. <laughs> um, so this is a picture showing that Japan Coast Guard approached the wave glider from their patrol vessel and uh, lifted the surface float the current profilers on the bottom of the surface float looked fine. Lots of shellfish were attached to the surface float. We even found some juvenile crabs on board. The wave glider was hundreds of kilometers away from the coast. I have no idea how the crabs could reach the surface float. Submerged wings were lifted and we found out the cable connecting the surface float and submerged wings actually became tangled around the submerged wings. And after this, we believe we couldn't control the wave glider, so it started to drift away. So precipitation maps obtained by a Japan Meteorological Agency's Doppler radar, Doppler radar actually confirmed that our wave glider entered the eye area of a typhoon. So column up here shows the precipitation uh, millimeter per hour uh, every three hours from panel A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, and the red points indicate the location of the wave glider. So if you look at this panel, so wave glider was in the typhoon eye area. So when plotted in the moving coordinate system, with its, with its origin at the typhoon center and the y-axis in the typhoon's direction, then the locations and uh, observed winds look like this. So typhoon wind was actually not symmetric around the eye. The blue vectors indicate the um, surface ocean currents about three meters below the sea surface. The surface current was actually faster, right? The behind the typhoon center. These are the close-up views of the typhoon eyes. The surface winds and surface currents were not really aligned at all around the eyes. So um, as you see, we successfully captured the surface winds and the surface currents simultaneously. This was the first time in the history, so we are really proud of it. But the, since we are marine biophysics in it. So we want to see the coupling between the biological processes and the physical processes. So we also investigated the biological responses to typhoons. While monitoring 
you know, all sorts of physical, biological, and chemical properties um, captured by these sensors. And the biological responses were examined using the images obtained from uh, video plankton recorders. Here are some examples. Um, Acantheria is a group of uh, uh, radio radian protozoa. So they are abundant around Okinawa all year long. And their skeletons are made of strontium. I don't know why they chose strontium, but uh, it's great. And uh, there are, they also contain photosynthetic bacteria in it. And one of my students, Maggie Bass Mars Brisbane, looked into this species really carefully, among other things. Here's another example, Trichodesmium. Trichodesmium is a colony of cyanobacteria. You can find them from spring to fall around Okinawa. This picture shows that Trichodesmium bloom like off the coast of a Great Barrier Reef. Trichodesmium actually has a special ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia, which is actually really important for tropical and subtropical oceans where the nutrient supply is limited. So my former postdoc, Mary Grossman, uh, investigated the plankton abundance change along with some like physics parameters, properties like uh, wave height and the biological parameters like bio and chlorophyll concentrations throughout a series of typhoons in 2013. And I'm going to show you the plankton abundance change during the first one, Typhoon Toraj, and also Typhoon Danas, which I already showed you earlier. So Mary categorized the images obtained by plankton recorder into 12 different groups. Okay, the trichodesmium and the radio radians are one group independently and there are um, 10 more groups. And the green lights here, green numbers here, indicate the change in the abundance for each category during typhoon torch. So you can see that actually many groups increased during typhoon torch. Some are increased more than 100%. So red numbers here indicate the changes in abundance during typhoon danas. Some group increase, but differently from the case for typhoon trudge. And actually some group disappeared. We cannot explain why this happened, but we suspect one of the reasons is, is uh, I, I guess uh, the, the, our sampling location relative to the typhoon track. Our sampling location was the right hand side of Toraj and the left hand side of Danas. So that might be one of the reasons. So these typhoon observations during the R&D cluster project actually attracted uh, many scientists. So we started the joint typhoon observations in Okinawa with the NTT, a large Japanese telecommunication companies. They provided a new wave glider. Yeah, we didn't pay for that any, so. <laughs> and uh, also the two professors from the Kyoto University's disaster prevention, disaster what was the name? Disaster Prevention Institute. And they brought in a 10 wave monitoring buoys and we didn't pay for it, so. <laughs> and also, we, probably two more research centers are going to join our typhoon observations in, 2000, in 2024 or later. So if we really want to have a research center, uh, we may want to take advantage of typhoons somehow because typhoon studies somehow attract researchers to Okinawa. So during this R&D cluster project, the marine biophysics unit expanded. And in 2017, at the end of the R&D cluster project, marine biophysics unit had uh, four postdocs, three technicians, six students, two interns, and two part-time assistants, covering a wide range of research topics. So I tried to spend more time on my students and postdocs during after 2017. And in 2022, we had a research unit review 
for years of 2021 through 20, 20, 2017 through, through 2021, uh, four or five year period. We had uh, 35 publications, and I just want to briefly mention two of them, which I'm really proud of. Um, uh, one project is actually designed by my, uh, by, uh, my former postdoc, Angela Ares. She's actually there. And also one of my former students, Maggie, they looked into how typhoons actually make changes, cause changes in the bacterial communities in the Okinawa coral reefs. And uh, they especially looked into the responses to so-called red soil runoff. And this paper was actually uh, introduced as a must-read article in the Microbiologist magazine. And uh, I really liked this project. You know, Angela and Maggie wanted to have something, some project in which all marine biophysics unit members can participate. And it worked out really nicely. And another one is the extension of our Western Pacific hydrothermal vent studies. So we published a synthetic paper together with a Professor uh, Lisa Levin from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So this work was introduced as um, in uh, for a policy brief for a meeting of uh, International Seabed Authority in 2020. We tried our best to bring in external funding, and these are the funding led by the Marine Biophysics Unit members, and uh, one of my former postdocs, Yosuke Yamata, did pretty well. He brought in the four fundings, including a prestigious JST Forest Grant. We got a lots of visitors, 40 visitors, including a six interns and three visiting students. Uh, some notable ones are like Andreas Anderson from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, SIO, Amatsuya Genin from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Stephen Monismis from Stanford. This collaboration actually led to a uh, bigger grant later on uh, from uh, US NOAA. And Amatsuya Genin actually served as a co-supervisor for Kota Ishikawa. So Kota looked, investigate, investigated how the ocean turbulence affect fish feeding behaviors. Also, we, Stuart Sanding uh, from also SIO uh, came to Okinawa responding to my request. They actually created a really fine scale three-dimensional map of uh, coral reefs around Okinawa, just like in this movie. So this is actually coral reefs. I think you will see the shape eventually. And uh, they have a three-dimensional like coordinates with species information at each location. Idea is we look at the changes over five-year time period. The marine biophysics unit student and postdocs really loved outreach activities. They did the 25 school visits and the six public lectures. That's really amazing. And uh, we were also awarded for the developing uh, the tidal forecast system for the Kerama Islands by the Japan Coast Guard. And we appeared in the media time to time. And uh, you might remember there was a massive beaching of pumice in October 2021. And I explained how long this was going to last. And also I explained why we had a massive beaching in 2021, but not 35 years ago, when the same underwater volcano had eruptions. So after this, I was uh, introduced as a pumice expert, but which <laughs> I'm not. So this picture shows the MBU members are uh, actually doing, uh, went to uh, FM Yomitan, gave a uh, you know, nice broadcast on, uh, on uh, like marine conservation for Okinawa. During this time, the three students graduated, uh, Evan Economo and I co-supervised the Patricia Webfer and Maggie. After completing a PhD, she got a prestigious postdoc fellowship from Hui, Woodsford Oceanographic Institution. And she's now an assistant professor at the University of South Florida. And Bob is a postdoc at the Academia Sinica. And the four postdocs departed during this time. 
all of my students and postdocs did really well, and thanks to their efforts, we got the really highest evaluation from the external reviewers. As of today, the six plus one students got the PhD from the Marine Biophysics Unit. I also co-supervised one student from Oxford. And Kota Ishikawa and Otis Prana are going to uh, join the graduation ceremony this May. So I have to think about the speech for them, which is a bit a headache, but um, anyway, so with that, I'd like to finish my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Satoshi, for this really, providing this really informative journey. We have time for uh, some questions from the audience. Okay, so maybe I will start. That's what I learned. You know, uh, there's uh, the silence, so I, I, I have to say something at yes. the beginning. Uh, but I, I'm really, uh, I, I remember uh, your paper published about the soil runoff mm -hmm. with, the, you know, the, the bacteria and so on. Um, at the time, I, I think w when I saw this article, I'm wondering, um, uh, is it still safe to swim uh, in the ocean, especially the beach close to us? That's a very good question, and uh, I have to answer to the question very carefully, right? And uh, um, <laughs> yes. how should I answer, Angela? <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> well, it's only lecture. Uh, um, I think um, it's, it's, it's important to gather this data, and, you know, like, let the authorities know about it. Um, I would say, like, for example, um, I remember being in the California coast, uh, and we wanted to get in the, co in the water. Uh, they said no swimming because yesterday, you know, it was uh, a heavy rain. Mm. Uh, so that there is like something that is already uh, established. I don't think we have enough data in Okinawa to know that. Mm. But I would say, like, we should, we should keep. Uh, should be careful. Especially after the rain, maybe mm -hmm. wait a couple of days. Maybe don't swim after the typhoon for many different reasons, mm -hmm. but just after the typhoon. But we also observe that it's very dynamic, so uh, it can, you know, these runoffs can be also uh, washed away too. So. I think Angela is really conservative here. <laughs> when we talk privately, she was talking more than that. Okay. But yeah, we should be careful. There, there, uh -huh. we found some pathogens, you know, right after the the typhoons, mm -hmm. heavy rains. So we should avoid those times, but as Angela said, we don't have enough scientific data. So we need to compile those, those data, and if we can make some suggestions to local yes. stakeholders. Yeah, policy makers. Yeah, that'd be great, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, even fisher, fishermen, yeah. Yeah, thank you. No, that'd I, be great. I think that's a very important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? Harry. Thank you. Um, about the contamination of water, that's certainly something that is done on a regular basis uh, in many waters around Australia, um, particularly Sydney Harbour that I'm familiar with, mm. and that's carried out by government bodies as well as by research institutes there. and there's a regular warnings to locals about water quality. So that's something that always could do. Right, right. Also, I have to say thank you very much for the Karama Currents modeling. And I would like to attest to its utility in helping us, well, not win, we came second, uh, a couple of sailing races that <laughs> I would, um, <laughs> the, the currents around the Karama Islands are very, very tricky. Right and that's how you win or lose a sailing race. Mm. But I would therefore ask you not to publicize it too much, because <laughs> we don't want the other skippers learning. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't think that way, and uh, so you're saying maybe I could make money for <laughs> selling those data. Yeah, you know, such, such as serving as a consultant. Right, right. You know, Angela is now working for Oyster Innovation, <laughs> so maybe we should talk about that. Indeed. <laughs> um, 
Do we have any other questions from the audience? So related to the runoff is like, I mean, normally runoff is a function of um, urbanization. Mm. The more you pave, the more uh, runoff you have. Right. And then, but it's like the first event is usually bad. If there's a following event close in close opposition, it's not as bad. Right. I was just wondering, like, because we have a lot of different areas in Okinawa mm. that are very different in terms of urbanization. Mm -hmm. Do you actually see a gradient? across, like say, if you compare the north versus the south? Um, <clears throat> this is, again, like a, more like a question to Angela, but uh, yes, we have been working on that, right? Angela did the sampling at the three different locations, including, uh, including like uh, really urbanized regions and rural areas, and we are comparing. We, we took uh, like really background information, how those like water properties and the bacterial communities change over time, and we are going to assess how the like, storms or like, seasonal changes are going to affect the water quality. And we are looking into that. And we just submitted the paper, right? It's the first thing. Right, yeah. Yeah. So I can explain more later on. Can you think of like use like application of machine learning techniques for those? Oh, I, yes, I do. You do? And you're not uh, going to share the idea with me? I'll, I'll share it with you, of course. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great, thank you. So Satoshi, I have one question moving forward. So you have shown, you know, from 2011, 17, and, and to now. So yeah. um, are you planning to work on something new and different um, starting 2024? Um, yes. And... Uh, yeah, one of the things I briefly mentioned about it, but uh, together with my US collaborators, we're going to look into how the coastal circulation processes are affecting the carbon chemistry in the coral reef waters. So this is funded by NOAA, and we have to assess how, for example, like aquaculturing is actually impacting the carbon chemistry in the coral reef waters. So we are going to work on that. So that's related to the seaweed farms, or, or that's something different? This is related to seaweed farm. Okay. And also this is included in, uh, in uh, you know, COI Next project, Center of Innovation. Yeah. I don't remember next part, but yeah. Okay. So uh, that, that's it. And also I have been uh, communicating with uh, Uehiro Center for Advancement of Oceanographic Research from the University of Hawaii. So we are... We just started uh, our discussions, but we will probably develop uh, some kind of collaboration with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions, comments? Uh, so if not, let's thank Satoshi for this really wonderful and engaging talk. So before we leave for coffee and snacks, I'm supposed to uh, present this plaque we, the core facility oh. members made for you. And I have to <laughs> also come up with, uh, with something. You can read it after. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Picture time. Oh, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> you too. Uh, oh. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.